thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. This is an uh, important day um, in governmental activities, as we know, it being election day. So our team here thought, well, what better way to spend election day than to talk about the government? Because I know we've all heard almost nothing about the government over the last days, weeks, months, quarters of year. Uh, but we wanted to take a genealogical bent on the government and specifically look at government documents at the federal, state, and local level. Um, they are amazing records that can provide a lot of context as well as a lot of detail for our families and our family stories. So it's awesome that so many of you decided to break away from the other government happenings of today and uh, focus on the genealogical government happenings, if we can call them that. Um, the handout is uh, meant to be evergreen. Evergreen means that you can refer to it later and I hope conjure up memories of this presentation and say, oh yeah, that's what Kurt talked about, or oh yeah, that's why I need to pay some attention to these state documents and uh, something you can refer to over and over again. So if you're expecting it to follow exactly my slides, uh, no, it doesn't because I put a lot of examples into my slides because I'll tell you straight up at the federal level, at the state level or the local level, finding the government documents that you need for your research can be a formidable task, especially if you haven't really tried to use those record groups before. But I really believe it's worth the look and sometimes it is quite a look to get some of that information, quite a search. That's why I kind of uh, titled it The Forgotten and the Maligned. You know, some of us, you know, don't think about other records besides census and birth, marriage and death. There's all kinds of other records, as we know, as good family historians, as good genealogists. And sometimes when we think about the government, we don't have the most positive thoughts. Oh yeah, that's the entity that taxes us. Oh yeah, that's the entity that fill in the blank, whatever your particular uh, pet peeve is. But the government, because it is a bureaucracy at the state, local and federal level, one of the blessed things about bureaucracies for us as researchers is bureaucracies create paper, records, digital files, lots and lots of, pardon the technical term, stuff. So, oh my goodness. Um, we kind of have to like governments as genealogists because they generate a lot of records for us. So I know it's not the best form to start out uh, a wonderful, uh, comfortable presentation with a test, but I want to have a test. And it's an easy test. It's a pass or fail test. As students, we probably hated those pass and fail tests, but pass or fail tests. But this is a test. Take a look at all of these items from panda bears to farming in a war zone to seabus monkeys, vitamin C, wind trajectories on polar ice caps. I know that's a burning issue for most of you. Pictures of Mars, painting in freezing conditions, George Washington's Revolutionary War correspondence. That might be of interest to some of us. What do all of these things have in common? All of these things, as you probably all guessed, can be found. All these subjects have been reported on, covered, et cetera, in federal government documents. Um, to me, that's kind of an oh my goodness moment. So even though probably as genealogists, we don't care about crop production related to education or pandas or wind trajectory on polar ice caps, the thin slice of federal government documents that are historical in nature and identify our ancestors and potential ancestors, even though that slice of the pie is so thin that we might be tempted to ignore it, the pie, the pie is huge. So even a thin slice of pie is tens, hundreds of millions of documents. And so I have a lot of examples to kind of whet your appetite to go through the pain. And it is kind of painful when you first start get used to the indexes and the indexing systems used for federal government documents. But at least there is a system for most state documents and local documents, even though they are rich in personal identifying data, oftentimes they're even more challenging to, to locate. 
So now that we've gotten our test out of the way, um, why government documents? Um, why should we care? Well, the government has been a part of our country, stating the plainly obvious, since the beginning, and our ancestors' lives since the beginning. The United States federal government remains among the largest legacy publishers in the world. They have been publishing, technical term again, stuff for almost ever. So that's why government documents are so important. Federal government, been publishing forever, one of the largest publishers in the world, and state and local governments pride themselves on being, quote, close to the people, close to the citizens. And in being close, they oftentimes will report on and capture life in different aspects other than the birth, marriage, and death, or the census records. Sometimes government documents can be substitutes for enumerations, having their own special enumerations and their own special vital record recordings. So government documents, they, they are a part of our lives. Everywhere you have government, you have the potential of documents if they've been um, retained. World's largest publisher is really Congress. Congress gathers information, they hold hearings, they conduct investigations, they compile reports, and they publish findings, just as the slide says. Um, sometimes, even when we think about newspapers, sometimes our perception of the historical value of particular entities is uh, overly colored or overly biased by contemporary times. Um, I'm gonna use newspapers as a quick example because we've been helping uh, undergraduate students use newspapers this morning in the Genealogy Center. Most of today's newspapers don't report on personal things, but all of us, I'm sure, in our genealogical research have found older newspaper society pages where you find out where people in the city or town went on vacation and who skipped church the past Sunday or who's gone a calling on someone, who's courting someone. So a lot of personal things you can find in papers. And so sometimes we're overly biased by how our federal government behaves today. And we say, oh my goodness, what do they do? Uh, what is the government doing today that generates records? that for three generations from now will evidence the lives of everyday citizens. I think we'd have to scratch our heads pretty hard on that one. However, just a few generations ago, Congress actually held hearings on pensions and decided who would get a pension, who would get an increase in a pension. Would a widow be entitled to more money based on her now deceased husband's service and what he gave, et cetera? So don't be too biased by what contemporary governments, particularly contemporary federal government does or doesn't do. Because in yesteryear days, um, a lot of things were accomplished by the government that touched people's personal lives everywhere throughout the country. So Congress has been very busy over the years, um, arguably much busier in yesteryear than in contemporary times. Um, so challenges of using federal government documents. So pay attention here. I say with a smile on my face, um, what's the biggest challenge of using federal government documents? There are so many of them, hundreds of millions of pages. And the first thing we think about as researchers, if there's that many, how am I gonna find the couple dozen that might give me stories about my family, that might give me answers to some of my ancestral brick walls? Second challenge, the collection does not lend itself well to browsing. When you walk into most public libraries, you can go to the sports section and there's baseball and soccer and volleyball all right there in the sports section. But I'll say this a couple times over the next few minutes. With federal government documents, they are cataloged and organized by publishing entity, by what branch of government published them. So. If there is the Senate and they're holding a hearing on collusion and baseball contracts and another committee is holding a hearing on um, what's going on in the tech world, well, it'll all be cataloged under some part of the Senate. It's almost as though we would catalog books or organize books in our library by author. So if I wrote a book about wine 
And then I wrote a book about my family. It'd all be in the W's under Witcher. Well, that would make sense for, you know, no everyday person. You'd look in the wine section for wines. and You'd look in the Witcher family section for Witcher. So we'll take an in-depth look about how that collection, how federal government documents are organized in just a moment. So there are so many of them. The collection does not lend itself well to browsing because subjects aren't grouped together. Published entries are, are grouped together. Oh, did I perhaps mention there are so many of them? <laughs> there are. There are truly so many federal government documents. Older print indexes may be challenging to use, and that's another challenge to finding federal government documents. Uh, it surprises me that more of them are not fully searchable online at Internet Archive or Hathi Trust or some other uh, digital silo. Um, I, I believe they're getting there, but they're still not there yet. So, so many of them not arranged well. Um, the older print indexes still really aren't available to us in a meaningful way digitally as they should be. And the last thing is, there are so many of them. I think you get the idea about so many of them. So organizing of federal government documents, as I've just mentioned, um, they're classified, federal documents are classified primarily by the publishing entity, and they are assigned a special number. It's covered in your handout. It's called a SUDOC number, Superintendent of Government Documents number. And the first part of those numbers you see on the right-hand side of your screen um, are departments of the federal government, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, et cetera. Let me just um, flip down a slide and um, show you what one of the problems can be. So I've highlighted defense, GPO, government printing office, Library of Congress, Department of War, and Congress itself. So if you're looking for a publication about the Mexican-American War, at the time it was fought, we had a war department. So if there was any information published at that time, it'd be in the W's under the Department of War. Congress could have held hearings about what was going on, how the war was executed, and more especially for us, most especially, they could have held hearings on pensions. Who was entitled to a pension, an increase of pension? The Library of Congress could have conducted an inventory of all the Mexican War materials that they received 50 years after the conclusion of the war. The Department of Defense could have published a book in the 1990s, as I know they did, one of the best books on Marines in the Mexican-American War was published in the 90s by the Department of Defense. So if you go looking for Mexican-American War material, you can't just look in Ds or Ws or Ys. You have to look in all three of those areas if you are going to browse. And because there are so many federal government documents, I never recommend browsing unless you have like days on your hands to kill and you're in a large federal government depository library. But that's just trying to highlight why it's really important to use the indexes. Uh, and there are many indices. Um, and most, shall we say, are somewhat available for our use. So let's continue on. Um, one might consider federal documents, federal government documents, if an ancestor, and you see the bullet points there, they're also on your handout. So before you leave this talk and say, I don't know what this Witcher guy is talking about. Why do I need to care about federal government documents? I have some awesome examples in just a minute, by the way. But if your family story, your ancestral line or potential ancestral line can intersect with any of these topics, had claims for losses because of military act activity, settled in a frontier area, suffered from a disaster, was a member of an oppressed minority, banking, railroads, First Nations, Native American, that kind of ups the possibility that your ancestor or potential ancestor may be mentioned or there may be great context for that person uh, in federal government documents. So we will take a look at some of those right now. So a federally funded entity, the National Soldiers Home Roster of Inmates in Massachusetts in 1882, um, Hard to see the screen, I know, but you can lean into your monitor. But here are the people. They're arranged by um, name, but then by company and rank, nationality, age, disability, um, and 
other associated data, nativity, where these people in this Massachusetts National Soldiers Home were born. This is a federal government document. And yet it has amazing specific identifying information. And so what war do you think these people were engaged in, in this 1882 soldiers home? A lot of them would have been in the war between the states, uh, the, the, the Civil War. And that is, there's just a close up of um, a couple of lines from this particular publication, records of the US soldiers home. So oftentimes in federal government documents, we will find great descriptions of records that are housed at the National Archives or at other federal government entities. And these can be useful in at least um, piquing our curiosity to say, hmm, maybe I should explore this further. Maybe I should uh, go online and see what other kinds of things are available for that particular uh, organization. And you can come up with some amazing publications with some amazing descriptive detail. This is one of the catalogs of holdings at the Library of Congress for different uh, time periods. And a lot of them have to do with people involved in government activities. So military, banking, railroad, commerce, uh, etc. But look how name rich that document is. Oftentimes in even catalogs published by the Library of Congress or other federal entities, there's enough what I call actionable information in those catalogs. So while we always quest to find original records, um, oftentimes we can say, wow, this description here has given me enough that I can go search Ancestry or Family Search or some other online silo to really burrow down to get more data on a specific individual. Uh, this is the Army Register for 18, excuse me, yeah, 1826. Notice about halfway down toward the bottom of the screen, halfway down and to the bottom, name of the person, their rank, um, et cetera. Medical staff, end pay, and purchasing departments, the name of the person, their rank, date of appointment, former commission, and remarks. Again, these are just samples. Uh, Many congressional documents have famous people from the hometowns of the representatives and senators read into the record. And some of these biographical readings into the record have three or four generations of individuals. Um, our country has always been proud of our ancestors who served in the military, who served to protect and preserve our freedom. Next week, we'll be celebrating Veterans Day and have a lot of great military programs, as Allison said just a few minutes ago. Well, the federal government being heavily involved in military activity, federal government documents are going to have a lot of amazing uh, biographical sketches on individuals um, who served. And not all of them are the famous generals, but more of the rank and file people where we find our ancestors. Uh, I have no ancestors who were um, squad commanders or generals, um, but I have a lot of privates and corporals and, and lieutenants, and, but privates, yeah. This is my one of my favorite federal government documents. Um, it's um, Naval Records of the American Revolution. Why am I excited about this? Uh, one, um, in my early day ignorance, or maybe I should say more profound ignorance, you could have knocked me over with a feather if you told me that there was one volume of a thousand pages of naval documents for the American Revolution. Yeah, the United States had a great robust Navy in the American Revolution. Again, in my ignorance, I would have said, yeah, a couple ships and a couple thousand men. Au contraire. This is volume nine. I believe they're up to volume 15 or 16. Notice the slim date range that volume nine contains in those three theaters, basically a couple of months in 1777. Each volume is more than a thousand pages. So right now they're up to 14 or 15,000 pages of naval documents of the American Revolution. This is still being 
currently published. So, so again, what I tried to mention at the beginning of the hour, you can't always go on the department of the government that existed at the time an event happened because any department can publish later records on an event. Look at some quick screenshots from this. So what would be in these 13, 14, 15,000 pages on naval records? Well, they found and reprinted as many advertisements as they could find. So here's an advertisement to encourage people to join the Navy. All gentle seamen and able-bodied landsmen, you know, who want to distinguish themselves. I mean, who wouldn't want to join after a nice, rich introduction like that? Um, and this is just a, a, an enlargement of that. It's um, quite quite amazing. Uh, the detail is, is just extraordinary. And like we're used to muster rolls in land-based troops and service records, well, here's a muster of sorts from a particular ship during the Revolutionary War time period. Isn't this gold for us who are trying to identify and document our Revolutionary War ancestors? This is pretty amazing. Muster roll of this particular brigade, August 31st, 1777, name, station, time of entry, wages, time discharge. Neat amount of detail. Um, and this is just a close up of one of those pages. So amazing things. Just some other examples of what I consider to be, pardon the use of the pedestrian term, cool federal government documents, historic resource surveys have amazing publications. This is one on the Pony Express. What was interesting to me is all of the out of the way places in frontier or frontier like areas where the Pony Express stopped. And they describe these places. What is that for us as genealogists? That's like a gazetteer. There's a gazetteer for frontier spaces. Sometimes we have a hard time finding specific documented towns, town, uh, burgs, uh, railroad crossings in frontier areas. Underground Railroad, um, again, sort of like a gazetteer or directory of underground railroad sites throughout the country. Oh my goodness, if you're studying this or trying to get more context around something that may have affected your ancestor, what an amazing source. And these are just uh, a close up of one of the pages of that underground railroad source. Congress, oh my goodness, Congress conducts hearings on all kinds of things, always has, always has. So here's a report that Congress received from the Secretary of War, basically reporting on um, African Americans, Negroes who were captured from the Indians in Florida, from the Seminoles, and the African American names are on the left-hand side, age, sex, and then the, the Seminoles names are a little bit to the uh, right-hand side of center, and then you see on the right-hand side how the family groups are grouped together. So um, a neat uh, way of identifying individuals in two ethnic groups that can be challenging to work with, African Americans and Native Americans, because the records are so inconsistent and so different than the records that we're used to. So all kinds of federal government documents. I think I was just queuing up this document when um, I noticed that there was no one around. Uh, so um, this is another report to Congress where um, a Quaker meeting house was basically reporting that, hey, we purchased the freedom of these African-Americans and now we find out that they are enslaved again. And so they're trying to present evidence to Congress to say, hey, we don't wanna have to purchase freedom twice for these individuals. So there's a notice of a particular Negro man, it says, calling himself William Jones, very dark mulatto, gives his height. Um, he was confined even though he was a free person of color. And you see all kinds of reports like, like that. Um, finding them using indices for federal government documents can be a challenge, but hey, if you're tired of election coverage this evening, hop on to one of the federal government uh, indices that are online and have a ball looking around. Um, there's so much, so much to be found. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about those indices. Um, they are numerous and varied. Um, the standard that's 
still largely in print is what's called the monthly catalog or the GPO, Government Publishing Office Monthly Catalog. Um, and more and more contemporary indexes are online. I'm just gonna give you a couple screenshots of some of the print indices um, that are a little difficult uh, to access and find, but these are ways you can get a hold of early government documents. And this is the kind of entry that you'll see. Alphabetical, of course, but it'll be people's names, as you see at the top, subjects, as you see next, beverages. So you have Francis A. Buter. And what's Francis hitting up Congress for? Well, third line down, you see in parentheses, House Report. So the House of Representatives has heard a report um, for relief of Buter. What does relief mean in most of these 19th century congressional reports, House or Senate? They're asking for more money for a pension. So Francis Buter's asking for more money. Mrs. Julia Buse, the third entry down, report amending and favoring House Report 3992 to increase pension. So um, you can find a lot of personal data uh, in these federal government documents, more so than you would expect to find in today's federal government documents. So we could make the case that maybe Congress of yesteryear worked harder than Congress of, of today. I'm now tempting the gods to terminate our internet access yet again. Um, so the United States Serial Set Index, this is what that index looks like. Again, a expected very pedestrian alphabetical listing but you'll notice all the things in parentheses. That's the actual citation, house report and the report number and where you can find it. Once you catch on to it, kind of like riding a bike, once you catch on to it, um, you easily and quickly figure out how you can access these documents. But the government was involved in everything. So claims filed in the case of schooner disasters on inland rivers and Great Lakes uh, in government documents. First Nations in federal government documents, um, amazing amounts of material. French settlements in Illinois, the French Board River, Tennessee surveys, um, just the breadth and depth of federal government documents, pretty amazing. Where do you find these federal government documents? Well, large land, excuse me, land grant colleges as well as large universities will have great collections of federal government documents. So will state libraries and so will major public libraries. So you'd be surprised how close full federal government documents are to where you are seated right now. And I have to tell you, yesteryear and today, federal government document librarians are kind of like those old Maytag repair person commercials. They're just so hungry for someone to come and ask them a question because they have all this knowledge about federal government documents and um, not a lot of people use them. Uh, so full, federal government repositories, land-grant colleges, major universities, state libraries, public libraries. Partial, nearly every college and university has some government documents, and most public libraries have some as well. It's worth exploring. So online access, increasingly more federal governments are available, federal government documents are available online, um, increasingly discoverable, um, there are some good indexes. I use the term kind of loosely, kind of hesitantly, because they're indexes that take some getting used to. So they're in your handout. They're also on the slide, GPO Access, Catalog of U.S. Government Publications, and Discover U.S. Government Information. That's actually a specific link in your handout. So here's the catalog. Isn't that an attractive, attractive web page, an attractive homepage? Gosh, it looks a lot like Google or Amazon. Not ever. But you do have a search box, and I'm going to move my cursor over it, sort of on the bottom right part of the screen. Um, with most indices that you haven't searched before, whether it's Ancestry or Find My Past or the Catalog of U.S. Government Publications, use the advice of less is more. Put in less terms than more terms. Also, try the advanced search. Usually, advanced search means or is synonymous with best search. Um, and when you're looking in a government database, try never to use United States or United or government or military because you're going to get millions of hits. So try to pick other keywords. 
So I did a search just as I advised you not to do, but I put it in quotes to nest the terms together. And I looked for war of 1812 material. I know that's a bad search. How do I know that? Because if I go down four lines, it says I only got 26 um, search results. And I know there's way more than that. So I would need to look for search under battles, search under states, search under other ways of trying to navigate data. But I just wanted to get a quick result set for you. Notice the entire title section is a link. So you can click on those and you think, aha, I'm gonna get the actual document right on my computer. Uh, no, that's way over on the right where it says internet access. Anytime you see a Perl, a permanent URL, an access, um, you'll get much richer data and oftentimes you'll get the whole publication itself. Uh, so um, this just gives you what a result screen uh, would look like. And if we clicked on any one of those, here's sort of the bibliographic record. So title against all odds, US sailors in the war of 1812. Notice the SUDOT number. So it was published by the Department of Defense. So even though the war took place long time ago, it was published by the Department of Defense Notice the subjects. I love bibliographic records online because subjects are typically a link. And we can click on that link and so we can pull together everything under United States, Navy, History, War of 1812 toward the bottom of your screen there. So instead of trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way to search? Now we're using a bibliographic record and we're using the linked subject tracings to get us more information. I, I love to use bibliographic records that way. Another site called Discover US Government Information. I just typed in the name Baldwin and there were many, many, many search results. These are more contemporary records. Um, we're gonna take a quick look at the um, Baldwin Apple Ladder Company. What the dickens is that? And so here's a report in the federal government documents on recognizing the Baldwin Apple Ladder Company. So here's the president. We don't have time to read through all this, but when they were founded, where they're founded, what they did, suffered a tragedy, fire burned up their 6,300 square feet. He was gonna retire, give it up, throw in the towel after 30 years in business, but decided, no, no, I'll, I'll make a go of it. What amazing detail. And this isn't about a famous general or isn't about you know, a Microsoft company. It's about the Baldwin Apple Ladder Company. So it's just amazing what you can find in federal government documents. So I call the next section, we'll have to go through quickly because we lost a little bit of internet time. I call them DigiDocs or things that are available online or in your library. The Library of Congress is American memory. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. It has amazing ways of getting in. Not easy, just amazing. There's a lot of information aggregators out there that are trying to compile better indices, but most of them are very expensive and they're in libraries and um, libraries pay a fee to provide you with access to those. So let, let's take a quick look. You can tell I'm kind of a, like all of you, I think, I hope, uh, I'm kind of a genealogy family history geek. This is a great site, a century of lawmaking for a new nation. Everything on the site, and my cursor's kind of going around these brightly colored squares. These are federal government documents. This bottom square here, statutes and documents. The statutes at large, the first actions of Congress, American State Papers, the US serial set. You can click on any one of those links and be led to a wonderland of federal government documents. And I'm just gonna go through these quickly. I wish we had more time to to, to laugh and chuckle about them, but this is what Congress was doing when Congress was doing really good biz. So in March of 18, um, what is that, 32, um, a bill for the relief of Jacob Rempf, otherwise known as Jacob Kempf, and he's looking for more money. Look at the dotted line down the right. Look at all that information about, about his, his military service a bill for relief of Nathan Carver. He wants $156.79 for medicine administered to and attendance bestowed upon six soldiers at a particular place in the state of New York during periods of the late war. 
um, for relief of Daniel Hazelton and William Palmer. They want big bucks. Uh, many, many, many generations ago, a sum of six hundred and seventy-eight dollars and twenty-five cents for extra expense incurred during copper bolting of the foundation of a lighthouse near Portsmouth in the state of New Hampshire. Amazing amounts of detail. Congressional debates where you can see kind of back and forth who was arguing what and who was saying what. Um, an act granting a petition to Sophie Brooke Taylor, widow of the late Major Francis Taylor. Look at all of the amazing detail that's provided about his military service and why she should qualify for a pension. Um, you have election results. How appropriate for today um, in federal government documents. Just absolutely amazing. There's like five pages in the House of Representatives reports about good old Jack Darwin and his horrible fate between England, India, and the United States and trying to get his naturalization. It's amazing. As I'm flipping through these screens quickly, this is a detail of his happenings, Great Britain, India, the United States. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So we're gonna quickly go into state government documents. Time seems to be fleeting, uh, fleeting us this afternoon. Um, why do we care about state government documents? I hope I've convinced you that federal government documents are at least a look. Why are state government documents important? Well, they're closer to where we and our ancestors lived. So we can expect to find even more granularity and even more details. Territorial laws are amazing in trying to decipher what institutions and organizations were around and what kind of reporting they were required to provide and what kind of records they were required to keep. It's absolutely amazing. Official manuals, directories, red books, blue books, yearbooks, annual reports. Anytime you see a state document that has a color associated with it, red, blue, um, it's like a manual of people who were engaged in government activities and organizations that received government funds during a particular reporting time period. It's pretty amazing. So here's the Indiana Annual Register and Pocket Manual for 1846. Look at that Victorian era title that like, goes on for miles. Treasurers, sheriffs, jailers, commissioners, accessors, school commissioners, justices of the, of the peace. And indeed, the whole publication is filled with who's serving where. It's pretty amazing. Not the best print, but pretty amazing. Biographical Annals of Ohio, a handbook of government and institutions of the state of Ohio in 1902-1903, more than a century ago. The main state yearbook for 1912. What's in there? Just every single town, their postmaster, selectman, town agent, clerk, treasurer. These are our ancestors. These peeps are, are part of our family story. Just as we saw at the federal level, information about military homes and orphanages, so too at the state level. So the state is supporting soldiers and sailors orphanages as this one is in Ohio in 1909. Look at the detail of information for these, for these orphans and more information about those who are employed there as well as people who um, are inmates or residents. The 28th Annual Report of the Superintendent and Board of Trustees for the Texas Deaf and Dumb Asylum, 1884. Oh my goodness, these types of state government documents. I know you can't read that, but we'll fix that in a minute. But here's Register of Pupils. Look at all those columns of information. So the name of the pupil, parents or guardian, post office, county, continuing across, cause of deafness, age at which deafness occurred, parent, whether related, deaf mute relatives, where the person's born, where their father was born, where their mother was born, when they entered the school. Is that a genealogical? Is that a, a specific data rich document? Oh my goodness, yes. Um, and we can find these in every state. Have to look for them though. And, and we'll touch in a minute on where and how we look for them. Here's Indiana territorial laws. Every state has their own territorial or beginning laws. I like the uh, 
parenthetical, not the parenthetical, but the uh, comments in the column that kind of give you an idea of what's being discussed over in the body of the law. So we're talking about um, bans of matrimony, wife's alimony, divorces, um, et cetera. Amazing things. This is part of the Indiana Code, 1832. Um, so these particular individuals in that top red oval are getting together to form the Decatur County Seminary. And notice in the bottom red oval, they're being instructed on what kind of records need to be kept. Trustees shall keep a record of all the proceedings in a book to be kept for that purpose, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, amazing detail. Here's an official manual for the state of Missouri for a little more than a half century ago. So it tells you all the state supported organizations, their faculty, their employees, where they live, how much they're getting paid federal soldiers, home employees, people that are elected for a particular office. Don't you feel sorry for this poor guy, Leroy? The only Democrat amongst all these Republicans in Greene County, uh, Missouri. So find a little levity wherever you, wherever you can. But postal directories in these state manuals oftentimes can be gazetteers where we can find the small towns and burgs where those are and what county they're in, because we know a lot of records are kept on a county level. If I didn't know anything about my father-in-law, he was born in Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky. Where the heck do I find where Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky is? We can Google it today. Most times it shows up. If we don't find it, we can go to a state manual and look at their postal directory. And 99.9% .9 of the time, something like Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky will show up and I'll tell you what county that it's in. Um, the official Blue Book of New Mexico for about a generation ago. This was an anniversary year for them. So all of the colleges are listed. All the historic churches and mission ruins are listed. The media outlets are listed. And you're greeted by a guy pointing a revolver at you. What more could you want in a document, right? Um, indices and access to state government documents. There are very few compared to federal government documents. State libraries typically have strong collections and so do large major public libraries. Colleges and universities are worth exploring as well. And those three W's at the bottom, Google is our friend. Go out, go out and search, search the web for some of those key terms that you see in your handout. Um, we're heading to the home stretch, uh, trying to leave a little bit of time for questions. So we've talked about federal documents, we've talked about state documents, I want to quickly touch on local government documents. You just never know what your local government may be keeping that could be of advantage to you in trying to context your family story and even in finding your family story. So what kinds of things are we looking for at the local level? Annual reports, messages from those people who are elected, mayors, aldermen, uh, et cetera, departments, many departments of city, county governments, operational ledgers. My favorite category is the last one, et cetera. All those things you may find in county and city government records that don't fit neatly into some of our preconceived categories. Let's take a quick look here. Um, I like this one because it was so close. It was one of my early discoveries more decades ago than I would like to admit. Uh, Fort Wayne Police Department, name, rank, okay. Politics, cool. Weight, height. Where born and when born? Oh my goodness, this is a state, excuse me, a city government document. It's their report to the Board of Public Safety on who all of their police officers are. And in that document, you get a little physical description where they were born and when they were born. That's an oh my gosh document, isn't it? Um, fire department kind of did the same thing. Age, nativity, height and weight. Um, here's a report from Charleston, New Hampshire for 1915 state road account. And you might think, okay, Kurt, this looks like a stretch. Well, these are people paying levies, taxes, if you will, for the maintenance of, of roads. Uh, county paupers, who got, um, or who, <clears throat> excuse me, who paid money for the care of, the burial of, dragging the river, milk for the Ware family, supplies for the Ware family, 
I mean, amazing amounts of detail. Um, I'm not sure we would all jump up with glee and joy to find our ancestors being supported, um, but life is life, uh, and uh, things things are the same generation after generation. Name rich documents. Um, here's a list of teachers, their residents, where they were educated, and how long they've taught in the area. Um, this is amazing for time periods where vital records are closed, birth, marriage, and death in some towns and counties throughout the country. In their annual reports, a town document, and this is for, I believe, yeah, Charleston, New Hampshire. They have a register of births every year in the early part of the 20th century. Look quickly as we go across here. Child, sex, name of father, maiden name of mother, parents, residence, father's occupation, father's birthplace, mother's birthplace. Oh my goodness, looks kind of like a vital record to me, but no, no, don't confuse them with vital records because vital records are closed. This is a city annual report and they did the same thing for marriages and they did the same thing for deaths. So as tenacious genealogists, we always find another way around when records are blocked from our access. And one way around is to use local government documents, town and county records. So amazing pieces of information. Even things like this is 1857 from the city of Cincinnati, receipts and disbursements of the city of Cincinnati. And you might think to yourself, oh my goodness, Kurt, you're really stretching this one. Well, as family historians, at the end of the day, what are we really looking for? We're looking for any document that has some degree, and we hope a large degree of reliability, that puts a person in a place at a time doing something. And so this receipt book, yes, it puts a person in a place at a time doing something. It tells us money being dispersed, but also notice um, in some of these that you actually get names of individuals who are conducting work for the city or being paid by the city for work for whatever reason. So you have a plumbing and painting and putting on a roof and repairing lock and keys, uh, stonework, et cetera. Some of these may be among our ancestors. So you just never know in local government documents where you're gonna find information. So again, like state government documents, um, even less indices and access points, but many of your local public libraries will have rich collections of their local city, town, county documents. And the Family Search Digitization Collaborative, we're trying to digitize as many of those as we possibly can find. Uh, state libraries also have awesome uh, silos, if you will, of not only state government documents, but also local government documents. Um, and as I mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago, increasingly more and more cities are on family history books. Um, so there's a, an amazing amount of information. So on this day where we've been consumed with not only internet outages, but uh, voting and all of the federal government activities that um, we may have gotten tired of. I hope I've rekindled your interest and your affinity for government and all of the wonderful records that governments generate that could contain amazing context for our family history, but also could actually give us person-specific information about our ancestors and potential ancestors. So let's don't forget them. Let's don't malign them. I mean, truly, you have paid for these. You might as well use these documents that, that you have paid for, and they could be the solutions to your, your research challenges. So.